Bohemian San Francisco, its restaurants and their most famous recipes, The Elegant Art of Dining, by Clarence Edwards. Section 5, including On the Barbary Coast, The City That Was Passes, and sang the swan song, a recipe and poem. On the Barbary Coast Much has been said and more printed regarding San Francisco's Barbary Coast, much of truth and much mythical. Probably no other individual district has been so instrumental in giving to people of other parts of the country an erroneous idea of San Francisco. It is generally accepted as a fact that in Barbary Coast vice flaunted itself in reckless abandon before the eyes of the world, showing those things usually concealed behind walls and under the cover of darkness. According to the purists here, youth of both sexes was debauched, losing both money and souls. To speak of seeing Barbary Coast brought furtive looks and lowered voices, as if contamination even from the thought were possible. No slumming party was completed without a visit to the coast, after Chinatown's manufactured horrors had been shuddered at. One cannot speak well of the Barbary Coast without bringing into consideration the social evil, for here was concentrated dozens of the poor unfortunates of the underworld, compelled to eke out miserable existence through playing on the foibles and vanities of men, or seek oblivion in a suicide's grave. We do not propose to discuss this phase of Barbary Coast, as that is not a part of Bohemianism. We have visited the coast many times, at all hours of the night, and beyond the unconcealed license of open caresses we have seen nothing shocking to our moral sense that equaled what we have seen in Broadway, New York, or in some of the most fashionable hotels and restaurants of San Francisco on New Year's Eve. Dancing, singing, and music, all that is embodied in the wine, women, and song of the poets, was to be found there. But it was open, and had none of the veiled suggestion to be found in places considered among the best. In Barbary Coast we have seen more beautiful dancing than on any stage, or in the famous Moulin Rouge, or Jardin Mabile of Paris. In fact, many of the modern dances that have become the vogue all over the country, even being carried to Europe, had their origin in Pacific street dance halls. Texas Tommy, the Grizzly Bear, and many others were first danced here, and some of the finest Texas Tommy dancers on eastern stages went from the dance halls of San Francisco's Barbary Coast. Vice was there, yes, it was open, yes, but there was the attraction of light and life and laughter that drew crowds nightly. Barbary Coast was a part of San Francisco's bohemianism because of its unconventionality, for, you know, there is conventionality even in vice. Here was the rendezvous of sailormen from all parts of the world, for here they found companionship and joviality. Up to the time of the closing of Barbary Coast, molestation of women on the streets of San Francisco was almost unheard of. Since its closing, it is becoming more and more hazardous for women to walk alone at night in the only large city in the world that has always had the reputation of guarding its womankind. The City That Was Passes Times change, and we change with them, is well evidenced by the restaurant life of the present-day San Francisco. Now, as before the fire, we have the greatest restaurant city of the world, a city where home life is subordinated to the convenience of apartment dwelling and restaurant meals, but the old-time bohemian finds neither the same atmosphere nor the same restaurants. True, many of the old names have been retained or revived, but there is not felt the old spirit of camaraderie. Old personalities have passed away and old customs have degenerated. Those who await the call feel that with the passing of the old city there passed much that made life worth living, and as they prepare to cross the great beyond, they live in their memories of the past. With reverence we think of the men and women of the early San Francisco, those who made the city the home of Bohemia, and it is with this feeling that we now come to discuss the Bohemian restaurants of the new San Francisco. And now sang the swan song, a recipe and poem. In the latter part of April, 1906, 
when the fire-swept streets presented their most forbidding aspect, and when the only moving figures to be seen after nightfall were armed soldiers guarding the little remaining of value from depredations of skulking vagabonds, a number of the old bohemian spirits gathered at the corner of Montgomery and Commercial Streets, and gazed through the shattered windows into the old dining-room where they had held many a royal feast. On the blackened walls might still be seen scarred pictures, fringed by a row of black cats along the ceiling. They turned their steps out toward the Presidio, hunted among the Italian refugees, and there found Coppa, he of the wonderful black cats, and it took little persuasion to induce him to go back to his ruined restaurant and prepare a dinner, such as had made his place famous among artists, writers, and other bohemians, in the days when San Francisco was carefree and held her arms wide open in welcome to all the world. It was such a dinner as has been accorded to few. Few there are who have the heart to make merry amid crumbling ruins of all they held dear in the material world. The favoured ones who assembled there will always hold that dinner in most affectionate memory, and to this day not one thinks of it without the choking that comes from over-full emotion. It was more than a tribute to the days of old. It marked the passing of the old San Francisco and the inauguration of the new. It was Bohemia's swan song, sung by those to whom San Francisco held more than pleasure, more than sentimentality. It held for them close-knit ties that nothing less than a world-shaking cataclysm could sever. And the cataclysm had arrived. The old copper restaurant in Montgomery Street became a memory, and on its ashes came the new one, located in Pine Street between Montgomery and Kearney Streets, and for a number of years this remained the idol of Bohemia until changed conditions drove the tide of patronage far up toward Powell, Ellis, Eddy, and O'Farrell Streets. At that time there grew up a mushroom crop of so-called restaurants in Columbus Avenue, close to Barbary Coast, such as Caesar's, the Follies Cabaret, Jupiter and El Paradiso, where space was reserved in the middle of the floor for dancing. Coppa emulated the new idea by fitting out a gorgeous basement room at the corner of Kearney and Jackson, which he called the Neptune Palace. It represented a great grotto under the ocean, and here throngs gathered nightly to dance and eat until the police commissioners closed all of these resorts, as well as Barbary Coast. Coppa became financially injured by this venture, and was forced to take a partner in his old restaurant, and finally gave up his share and went beyond the city limits and opened the Pompeian Garden, on the San Mateo Road, and there, with his heroic little wife, tried to rebuild his shrunken fortunes leaving the historic restaurant with its string of black cats and its memorable pictures on the walls to less skilled hands. He struggled against hard times, and at the time of this writing he, with his wife, their son and his wife, are giving the old-time dinners and trying to make the venture a success. In the old days it was considered a feat of gourmandizing to go through one of Coppa's dinners and eat everything set before you for one dollar. Notwithstanding the delicious dishes he prepared and the wonderful recipes, the quantity served was so great that one would have to be possessed of enormous capacity, indeed, to be able to say at the end of the meal that he had eaten all that was given him. In his Pompeian garden, Coppa still maintains his old reputation for most tasty viands and liberal portions, and if one desire to find the true bohemian restaurant of San Francisco today, one that approaches the old spirit of the days before the fire, he need but go out to Coppa's, and while he will not have his eyes regaled by the quaint drawings with which the old-time artists decorated the walls, nor the hurrying footsteps along the ceiling to the famous center table where sat some of the world's most notable bohemians on their visits to San Francisco, nor the frieze of black cats around the cornice, nor the bohemian verse, written under inspiration of Dago Red, he will find the same old cooking, done by Coppa himself. We asked Coppa what he considered his best dish, and he gave us the Irishman's reply by asking another question. What do you think of it? There are so many to choose from that our answer was difficult, but we finally stopped at Chicken Portola. It was then that the old smile came back to Coppa's face. Ah, Chicken Portola, that is my own idea. It is the most delicious way chicken was ever cooked. 
This is the recipe as Coppa gave it to us, his little wife standing at his side and giving, now and then, a suggestion as Coppa's memory halted. Chicken Portola a la Coppa Take a fresh coconut and cut off the top, removing nearly all of the meat. Put together three tablespoonfuls of chopped coconut meat and two ears of fresh green corn, taken from the cob. Slice two onions into four tablespoonfuls of olive oil, together with a tablespoonful of diced bacon fried in olive oil. Add one chopped green pepper, half a dozen tomatoes stewed with salt and pepper, one clove of garlic, and cook all together until it thickens. Strain this into the corn and coconut, and add one spring chicken cut into four pieces. Put the mixture into the shell of the coconut, using the cut-off top as a cover, and close tightly with a covering of paste around the jointure to keep in the flavors. Put the coconut into a pan with water in it and set it in the oven, well heated, for one hour, basting frequently to prevent the coconut's burning. A bare recital of the terms of the recipe cannot bring to the uninitiated even a suspicion of the delightful aroma that comes from the coconut when its top is lifted, nor can it give the slightest idea of the delicacy of the savor arising from the combination of the coconut with young chicken. It is not a difficult dish to prepare, and if you cannot get it at any of the restaurants, and we are sure you cannot. Try it at home some time, and surprise your friends with a dish to be found in only one restaurant in the world. If you desire it at Coppa's on your visit to San Francisco, you will have to telephone out to him in advance, unless he has succeeded in getting back to the city, which he contemplates, so that he can prepare it for you, and take our word for it, you will never regret doing so. Coppa has many wonderful dishes to serve, and he delights so much in your appreciation that he is always fearful something is wrong if you fail to do full justice to his meal. He showed us this one evening when he had filled a little party of us to repletion by his lavish provision for our entertainment, and nature rebelled against anything more. To us Coppa came in tears. "'What is the matter with the chicken, doctor? Is it not cooked just right?' It was with difficulty that we made him understand that there was a limit to capacity, and that he had fed us with such bountiful hand we could eat no more. Even now, when we go to Coppa's, we have a little feeling of fear lest we offend him by not eating enough to convince him that we are pleased. Coppa's walls were always adorned with strange conceits of the artists and writers who frequented his place, and after a picture or a bit of verse had remained until it was too familiar, someone erased it and replaced it with something he thought was better. We preserved one written by an unknown bohemian. We give it just as it was. Through the fog of centuries, dim and dense, I sometimes seem to see the shadowy line of a backyard fence and a feline shape of me. I hear the growl and yowl and howl of each nocturnal fight, and the throaty stir, half cry, half purr of passionate delight, as seeking an amorous rendezvous my ancient brothers go stealing through the purple gloom of night. I've seen your eyes with a greenish glint. You move with a feline grace. And when you are pleased, I catch the hint of a purr in your throat and face. Then I wonder if you are dreaming, too, of temples along the Nile, where you yowled and howled and loved and prowled with many a sensuous wile and borrowed the grace you own to-day from that other life in the far away, and if such dreams beguile. I know that you sit by your cosy fire, when shadows crowd the room, and my soul responds to an old desire to roam through the velvety gloom, so stealthily stealing, softly shod, my spirit is hurrying thence to the lure of an ancient mystic god, whose magnet is intense, 
where I know your soul, too, roams in fur, for I hear it call with a throaty purr from the shadowy backyard fence. End of section 5 Read by Sandra in Wales, United Kingdom, July 2006